Hello everyone and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry, a fan channel where everything Dragalia Lost can be found. This video is going to be all about Enter the Kaleidoscape. This was Dragalia Lost roguelike mode where you progress through up to 60 floors of a randomized dungeon, fighting bosses along the way, ultimately culminating in a battle against Bahamut. This was a mode that released pretty late into Dragalia Lost Live, so for a lot of the time that this mode has been out, we've also known that the end of service was coming for Dragalia Lost, and of course we now know that that's happening at the end of the month, right before November 30th, so this is your chance to play this mode and do anything else you want to accomplish in Dragalia Lost. Personally, I wanted to get some more clears of this mode completed because there were endeavors on the endeavor page here under normal endeavors for clearing this with 30 distinct adventurers. So I was finally able to do that over the past couple of weeks. I had been doing three clears of this a day. It is a little bit of a more time consuming mode, but you can do up to three clears per day, skipping ahead as many as 40 floors making it much less of a time suck and the reward for this mode for those who do choose to partake in it are portrait worm prints that are some of the strongest in the game the combination of abilities you can get from them and of course have pictures of your favorite adventures the ones who you're clearing it with so i did get my 30th clear which is going to be the final one for me with eleonora over this past week and i just wanted to make this video to kind of provide an update on my progress and also, so that we could check out some of these Memories of the Sacred Tree together. Haven't read all of these, even though they're all unlocked here. So I wanted to do that with y'all, especially since I know not everybody's going to finish this content. So I thought this would be a good way to preserve this and share this with those who did not unlock all of these story snippets, which are also gated behind clearing this mode with a certain number of characters. So that's the plan for today. I'm going to start off with sharing the characters that I completed this mode with and also just a little bit on some of the mechanics of the mode itself. So the first thing I want to start off with is the Fafnir upgrades. This was a huge time saver for me and I have to say it made every subsequent run much easier by getting some of these upgrades. The biggest one I recommend is this EXP upgrade. That's going to make it so if you are trying to farm out your last few clears in this mode it's just a lot smoother. Your character level is more appropriately balanced with the enemy character levels you're playing against. And so that's going to be a really big pickup. Other than that, all of these other upgrades are totally fine. You can get them after you get that EXP upgrade. But this is a form of permanent progression in this roguelike mode that carries over from run to run. And at this point, you don't really need all of the amber, the dusk amber and the dawn amber that we were previously using in the treasure trade because, well, there's not a whole lot you're going to be able to do with this after the end of service, so there's not necessarily a reason to cash out the treasure trade here, so you can definitely spend that on Fafnir upgrades instead. Of course, there were some weapon skins in here as well, and I know that was one of the things that excited players about this mode in the past, but as you can see, I've unlocked, I think, all of those at this point. Anyway, that's just a little bit of context on the mode, and I also want to share, before we get into those Sacred Tree stories, the characters that I completed it with, so I thought the easiest way to recap this would be to go through my portrait worm prints. The first half or so of these worm prints are the clears when I only went through floor 50, because for a while that was the maximum floor. So I went through floor 50 with Eleonora, Gala Leonidas, Alvarius, the twins, Ayaha and Datoha, Basilius, Incognito Neferia, Sharpsuitor Cerise, Not, Tiki, Pietro, Nadine, Mitsuba, and Forager Mitsuba, Mine, that was a particularly challenging one, Pinon, Mona, Maranoa, Izuno, and then the rest of the New Year's cast here. So Shingen, Yukimura. And I also did some repeat clears of floor 50 because it was pretty easy to auto. So I did do some farming with the twins. And then I also got some more floor 50 clears after that with Kimono Knot, Valix, Julieta, Ferris, uh, Galazena, 
Rosarda, Civilian Leaf, Annalie, Halloween Laxi, Joker, and Bondforged Yudin. I think the very last Floor 50 clear I got was with Gale and Nedric, and you may remember that was right around the time we found out the end of service was happening for Dragalia Lost, and we also ended up getting Floor 60 not long thereafter as a content update, so I definitely slowed down on playing this mode after that, unfortunately. just I, It was a fun mode, but it was very time consuming, and knowing that you know, I wasn't necessarily going to need all these special worm prints for all that much longer. I definitely slowed down. And what you'll see here, starting with Gil and Nedric, the rest of these are floor 60 clears. Well, a lot of the same adventurers that I found to be effective to clear through floor 50, I ended up using again to clear through uh, floor 60 as well. And I guess one of the big differences is toward the end, I did start to focus on certain elements and certain weapon types where I didn't have an ideal worm print just yet, like the Shadow Mana Caster, the Water Axe here, and I wanted to try farm for a better worm print, so I repeatedly cleared with different adventurers in that same weapon type, Flame Sword at the end. But the final victory that I got was with Eleonora, as was the first victory I got, so I thought that was a nice bit of uh, parallelism in the beginning, so in the end, but anyway, that's pretty much it as far as my Kaleidoscape journey. So we're going to go back here into Enter the Kaleidoscape. And I thought it'd be cool to just read through these memories of the Sacred Tree. I'll probably read these out loud because I don't think there's any voice acting for these. So I'm just going to read them out loud. I'm thinking about making some videos to preserve some of the other stories in the game and then maybe talk about, you know, which ones were my favorites. I think there are some other channels already on YouTube and some other resources that do that pretty well. So I'm not totally sure whether uh, that'll be my plan or not, but I might record them anyway just so I have them before the game ends its service, just in case you never know what may happen in the future. So that's something that I am thinking about. But for now, let's focus on the memories of the sacred tree, starting with the path of inception. In the beginning, in an emptiness, void of sky or earth, light or dark, man and dragon awakened and made a pact. The man would craft heavens for the dragon, while the worm would form earth for his human counterpart. This agreement, the Pact of Inception, was the first of its kind, and it gave birth to the world and all life in it. That world was proof of the pact between human and dragon. Dragalia. Next up, the Primordial Dragons. The origin's joy became light, and his woe dark. His sigh was fire, his tears the ocean, his roar the wind that rushed over the land. The world was embraced by the will of the dragon. The origin granted each of these a name. To the light, Jupiter, to the darkness, Zodiark, to the flame, Brunhilda, to the waters, Mercury, to the wind, Midgard Sormer, and the land he had created for all people, he named Elysium. Dragon Blood Kingdom After the death of Alberius, the dragons followed his dying wish and endeavored to build a peaceful kingdom, but the people grew accustomed to their support and began to seek aid excessively. Wary of this, dragons withdrew from the world and hid themselves away, save for the packs that joined them to the royal family. Even though it ran counter to Alberius' ideal, dragons and the humanoid races lived apart, unable to find common ground. Harmony the principle of harmony between people and dragons was a way to keep the Holy Worm from harming the human world. And after Ilya's death, her adherents defied, deified the dragons and isolated them in an attempt to maintain this accord. After the battle with the other, the believers who followed Alberius 300 years ago drifted away from the church and chose to follow their own path, for they sought harmony between dragons and people in the truest sense. Corrosive Hatred 
black mana is hate, the resentment of the progenitor sealed away in another world. Hate is ruin. Hate is denial. Hate is impulse. Just as one cannot fully control their emotions, none can quell this maelstrom of fury. The progenitor's passion filled the other world and eventually overflowed it. The space between worlds, which ought to have been void of all things, gradually filled with the progenitor's hate and encroached upon all worlds everywhere. Fairies and Agito The fairies are a race that inherited the power of creation, but if one seeks creation, they will inevitably seek greater power. So it was that the fairies reached out for black mana and used it to form five terrible beasts. These beasts were called Agito, and initially, they were the fairies' hope. But the black mana became too much for them, so they sealed the power into masks and locked them away as the most forbidden of fairy kingdom treasures. Dragon Blood and Fragments of the Mark When the primal marks of Elysium and Ilya clashed, the impact of it sent a torrent of power flooding out, fragments of the mark. This torrent ran down upon the world and pierced through the people. Most of those pierced could not endure the power and were annihilated. However, some among them survived and gained the ability to parlay between people and dragons. Thus was the beginning of dragon blood. many worlds of the Auspects. In many of the varied worlds of possibility, the seventh scion surrenders his body to the other in order to save his sister. Having then obtained dragon blood, the other lets his hate run rampant and overruns the whole of the world. The scion sister seeks a dawn shard that she might change fate. In some worlds, she falls before reaching it, in others, she dies at the hand of the other. That an Auspex from another world is here is nothing short of a miracle. Shogun of Hinamoto After Amaterasu devastated Hinamoto in the War of Earth and Heaven, she swore to never again act upon this land. But war raged on, and touched by the ardor of a young warrior, she chose to wield her strength anew. With her power, the young man united the nation, but he did not wish to be king. Instead, he became a warrior who would protect its true monarch, Amaterasu. Thus was a nation born governed not by a king, but by a shogun. The Era of the Chillin the era of the ancient Chilin was the most technologically advanced in history, one free of starvation, illness, and all forms of suffering. But once happiness was assured, people began to focus more on others' joy than their own. Soon, they could not accept others being even a tiny bit happier than they were. Neighbor battles neighbor, and soon these small conflicts ignited a flame that scorched all in its path, consigning nearly all chillin to the dustbin of history. Those of the Sea A millennium ago, the other's miasma reached the ocean. Leviathan fought against it, but in the aftermath, an island was drowned in the waves. In order to save its people, the dragon sent a continuous stream of air to the ocean floor. The people of the island learned that it was because of them the worm was bound here, so they used alchemy to reshape their bodies and acclimate to the sea. This was the origin of the Abyssians. Sandreach Eternal Long ago, there was a kingdom known as the Sandreach in a southern desert, but Dyernell invaded in order to claim their magical arts, and the kingdom was set upon a path to ruination. With her kingdom on the verge of collapse, the queen told her people thus, Live freely, 
for wherever this kingdom's people are, that is where it lives on. Her people held to her words, and 300 years later, the Sandreach Kingdom still exists all across the world. Matamaton to Android Over a millennium ago, an android slipped into this world from another. This being was far more advanced than anything in the new world, and its engineers were fascinated. They soon set about making their own copies of it, creations which came to be known as automatons. Over time, people learned to use automatons for the purpose of war, and it did not take long for them to be renamed as combat androids. Demons of Possibility The beings known as demons are people, are dragons, and yet are neither of those things. They are beings created in the mold of dragons by the progenitor, and he sought to gain his own form of possibility from them. Demons were the progenitor's answer to the notion of possibility, which to him was the repudiation of the status quo a rejection that led to the destruction of all. He sought to mock the very notion of possibility, which is why demons reject and destroy everything. The Archangel Metatron The demons were born out of the progenitor's scorn for the possibility extolled by the dragons, but there was one among them who dissented and split from her fellows so she might fight for a world of possibility. The Archangel Metatron Metatron was the first angel. She fought for possibility, but her desire was to create new things and watch them grow. Her actions were still a denial of the status quo. Her essence as a demon remained. From Love to Perdition The scrolls of perdition, as the records would later come to be called, were left behind by Mine, the fairy who worked tirelessly to establish the Ilian religion. They represented the love of a mother who desired to remember the days spent with her beloved daughter. To the Ilian religion, the scrolls were dangerous heresy, so they decided one could not touch them until they were purged of all sin, which is how they came to bear the name of perdition. Born of Piety The scrolls of perdition were divided into several volumes and given to five pious saints. One of these was Saint Dyernell, and for years his family guarded the documents faithfully. But 300 years ago, the descendants of Saint Dyernell in their piety, opened the scrolls and read them. Written within was the truth of the goddess and the other, as well the world and the holy worm's deception. After this, Dyernell rose up in order to create a just world. Tree of Memory One of the things wrought by the origin was the original fairy. She had inherited more of the power of creation than any other and lamented the conflict between creators more than any other. And because of this, she was moved to preserve her memories for all time. Realizing her body had reached its limit, she transformed herself into a form that could survive through the ages. The fairies greatly respected this determination, and so they named her the Sacred Tree and took up the mantle of safeguarding her for all time. Vessel of Memory The Halidom is a place of many mysteries. Not even Alberius, who used it as a base in the war against Dyernell 300 years ago, knew who built it or for what purpose. And little wonder seeing as the castle simply appeared out of thin air hundreds of years prior. The sacred tree kept its vigil and held the memory of the world for many, many years, but after all that time, it was approaching its limit. 
and so a fairy chosen by the tree changed into a kind of receptacle for storing the memories of the world. Its form was a strong vessel which would last through the war, the Halidom. And finally, Master of the Treasury. Eventually, some of the memories held by the sacred tree were scattered and took the form of a great labyrinth. At the Halidom, a guardian of memories was chosen to prevent any of these from being lost, Fafnir Roy. Fafnir Roy named himself Master of the Treasury, for he knew the memories of the world stored at the Halidom were the most valuable treasure of all. Memories are proof of bonds and evidence of possibility, after all, and that is something which even the Creator must not tear asunder. And there you have it. Those are all the memories of the Sacred Tree. I have to say I had a lot of fun reading through those. Some lore elements that are not really explained anywhere else in Dragalia Lost. Some references to ancient cultures and unique peoples of the world like the Abyssians, the Sandreach Kingdom, the Androids, even Metatron is mentioned here, and we kind of find out, I don't think this is present anywhere else, that the Sacred Tree is actually a fairy, and so, in some sense, is the Halidom is another vessel of memory when the tree seemed like it might be under siege or limited in its ability to preserve the memories of the world during the war 300 years ago. There's a lot of good stuff in here. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll probably have to do at least one more story-related video before the end of service. You could probably tell based on my endeavors that I showed earlier, but uh, there are a couple fights that I have yet to clear and have been uh, waiting to do those for a while. And in addition to those main campaign battles, there's also master difficulty of Primal Midgard Swimmer still on the horizon for me. So expect content regarding both of those pretty soon here in the next week or so. But that is going to do it for today, everybody. Thank you as always for watching. Take care and I'll see you next time.